The title of the session is Terrorism in Israel and Europe, Prospects for an Alliance Against a Converging Threat. I'm Professor Alan Johnson. I'm a senior research fellow at BICOM, and I am the editor of its online journal, Fathom. Our most recent post is an expert uh, piece by uh, Peter Neumann from King's about the threat of uh, returning jihadis, which we heard about from the Home Secretary. Please check that out. From 2008 to 2010, I worked at the UK Home Office, tracing the journeys taken by young British Muslims into and out of extremism, and helping to develop communication strategies to counter radicalization. A um, few words of introduction. Not long ago, the sensible commuter in an average European city could reasonably assume that she was generally immune from the kind of security threats faced regularly by her friend living in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. Today, the increasing interconnectedness of Islamist terror threats faced by Europe and Israel is forcing her, that commuter, to reconsider. And it's forcing policymakers and decision makers to ask themselves, how can Europe and Israel work together to keep their citizens safe? The security ecosystem affecting Israelis and Europeans has converged dramatically and negatively. We heard from the Home Secretary about the seriousness of the threat that we face. In the coming decade, surely making Europeans able to go about their normal business and safety will necessitate a concerted effort to develop some um, relationship between Europeans and Israelis to better understand the modus operandi of jihadist terrorism, to share best practice, to work out your hard power, our soft power, how can we share the best ideas to strengthen each society. So today, to lead our dialogue, we have three real experts. Um, the full biography is in your pack, so I'll just say Dr. Osama Hassan to my left um, is head of Islamic studies at the Quilliam Foundation. As a teenager, he became a radical Salafi activist and took part in the jihad against communist forces in Afghanistan. I remember us talking about that many years ago together. Um, Suha Halifa, on my right, is editor of the Times of Israel Arabic edition, a role she's held since the publication launched three years ago. And uh, to my left, delighted to welcome Professor Shlomo Avaneri, who is, amongst many things, professor of political science at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. We'll begin by asking about the nature of the threat and understanding it and as time allows, hopefully we'll be able to say something about countering the threat and then end by some ideas about cooperation between Europe and Israel to defeat the threat. And there'll be some time for questions and answers if we can get all of that in. Osama, let's, let's start with you perhaps. I do remember we sat about eight years ago in your university <coughs> office and we spoke about the phenomena of Islamist radicalization of young British Muslims and how to counter it. Could you tell us a little bit about how, in your view, in the years since, how has that threat evolved? What are the main lessons we've learned about fighting radicalization? And, and what's the nature of the threat we face today? Uh, th thank you, Professor. Uh, I think in those last eight years, or just over a decade since, the 7-7 bombings, which uh, uh, prompted a, a lot more work and activity in this regard, of course. I think there's good news and bad news. Obviously, the threat, as the Home Secretary mentioned, uh, it is worse actually now than it ever was uh, in Europe with the emergence of, of ISIS, uh, with hundreds of uh, European, well, thousands of European fighters having joined ISIS, including several hundred uh, British ones. On the other hand, there has been a lot more engagement uh, by government, by civil society, by Muslim communities and others uh, in terms of trying to address this problem. And uh, I think what we've learned is that the the soft power, if you like, the engagement, uh, especially in the prevent space, uh, is very helpful. Now, the uh, prevent strategy of the government gets a lot of criticism. Um, and of course, it's not perfect, no government strategy is, it, it has its flaws. Disclaimer here, I actually do work for prevent. Uh, and those of us who work for prevent actually know its flaws better than other people, actually. I think and we're, we're very critical at the Home Office uh, when we give our feedback. Uh, but uh, what's often forgotten is that some of the opposition to prevent is orchestrated by uh, Islamist organizations, some linked to jihadist organizations who have a natural uh, objective in uh, trying to scrap prevent or certainly trying to uh, stain its reputation. Secondly, 
People are more aware of this now. There are literally hundreds of families, Muslim families around the country, uh, mums and dads who've called the police because their sons or daughters want to go to Syria, for example, and join ISIS. Uh, they've called the police to say, what can I do? My, uh, my son or daughter wants their passport. I've hidden the passport, but what, what more can I do? Uh, because I, can I work for Channel? I, I know of cases like that. I've been to their houses where the, the young man had been referred to Channel, and it's come from the mother or father. Uh, who's desperate to, uh, uh, to stop them going out there. So, and I think because of all this kind of work, there's a stronger sense of uh, civic identity, what unites Muslims, Jews, atheists, Christians, uh, people of different backgrounds, and that really is, has to be a civic identity uh, in terms of uh, Britain and the modern nation state. And, and I think that, that clash of values, if you like, between fundamentalism and uh, extremist Islamism, uh, which fuels Al-Qaeda and ISIS uh, and other terrorist groups, and um, kind of universal modern uh, notion of citizenship, etc. Uh, you know, that's the intellectual and spiritual clash, if you like, going on behind the scenes. And uh, a lot of the successes we've seen uh, are in engagement uh, through community and through dialogue and debate. Thank you very much, Osama. I'm sure we'll come back to some of those issues in the UK scene, but I'd like to turn to you if I could now and ask, um, let's talk about what's sometimes called the stabbing intifada. That may or may not be a, a term you, you would use. Um, we've seen since October 2015 to October 2016 in Israel, 42 victims killed, 577 wounded, 163 attackers arrested and 196 attackers killed. There tends to be two narratives about this stabbing intifada in Israel. One begins with Palestinian incitement as the cause. Another sees Israeli occupation and Palestinian hopelessness as the cause. I know we talked earlier, and you think perhaps neither of those perspectives quite gets us there in terms of understanding it. So how, how do you understand this intifada, the, the rammings and the stabbings and the shootings? Uh, what's its meaning? How should we understand it? Um, there has been debate whether it is an intifada or not, I, I happen to think it's not. Um, also, the, the narratives vary. Uh, Israeli politicians, um, their go-to reason is PA incitement and social media. And um, the Palestinian Authority um, says it's occupation and hopelessness. The perspective that's often ignored is the one of the Israeli security forces, the Shin Bet and the IDF. And according to them, while they do not completely disregard uh, incitement, they say that hopelessness and um, poverty and anger and um, frustration is what's driving those lone wolf attackers um, who are often not politically affiliated and have no security background um, whatsoever. Um, I, I think it's easy for politicians to go to incitement and to go um, towards the direction of fear mongering because it's effective. But it's effective for them as a political tool. But I, I don't think it's very productive for a society to take that approach. Because if you look at the big picture, um, there are about 100,000 Palestinians who enter Israel with permits. And according to Eisenkot, um, IDF chief of staff, there are an additional 50 to 60,000 who enter Israel daily without permits. If you look at this 160,000 people who enter Israel daily, and you look at the numbers of attacks, the, uh, is it a few hundred over uh, the course of a year? Mm -hmm. When you put that in that perspective, I'm not saying um, attacks are not dangerous. I'm not saying people are not scared. But I'm saying that perspective is very important. And when you have politicians who are um, well, I don't have another word other than fear-mongering and typecasting all Palestinians as terrorists. That does 
well, a disservice to Israeli society. And it's very ineffective in terms of preventing future oppression or hopelessness or prospective attacks. Mm -hmm. Okay, just before we bring in Shlomo, we talked before, uh, some people talk about suicide by cop and some, some people say that there's, there's a mix of motivations and meanings behind these. Is, is, is that something you would, you would share? Um, well, the Shimbet has uh, pointed out also, um, to those of you who don't know, the Shimbet is a, the intelligence service in, in Israel. They have pointed out that there's a, a, a copycat effect. Mm -hmm. And there have been, um, uh, for instance, the siblings in Kalandia, where the mother was, a, well, the sister actually, was pregnant and she was in an abusive relationship and she just wanted out. And for her, that was an easy way out because she has seen suicide attempts sure. being successful. And she threw the knife away. Before, exactly. Right? And we haven't seen videos, but from the, the IDF's own account, she threw the knife and it was meters away. Mm. She wanted to get shot. She wanted to die. Mm. And shooting to kill instead of disarming ends up getting the opposite effect. Okay. Thanks very much. Shlomo, and if we could bring you in, we've heard from the UK and we've heard from Israel, but I wonder if you could give us a bigger picture of, of the geopolitical context in which we're seeing the rise of jihadist terrorism. To do, we're certainly looking at the rise of jihadist movements, the fall of the Arab state system, and surely this is the bigger overarching framework within which we're seeing the kinds of incidents that both Osama and Suha have been talking about. Well, thank you very much, Ellen. First of all, two preliminary remarks. I'm very glad about the uh, figures you, uh, you mentioned, because terrorism is usually, is always, a minority phenomenon. The question is, do you identify this minority, or do you stereotype the whole community, or communities that very much agree with you that we should never stereotype. Secondly, terrorism is terrorism. It doesn't matter if you're being blown up on the bus in Tel Aviv, or Jerusalem, or London. This is terrorism. However, I think one should look at context. And the contexts are not identical, they are overlapping, and one should make distinctions. Terrorism in Israel, or indirectly against Jewish communities in Europe, has to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And not all of those terrorists are jihadists or Islamic fanaticism. Some of them are secular and nationalists. They have been in the Intifada and also now. So when we talk about terrorism in Israel, uh, we talk about an outcome or outgrowth of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in all its ramifications. When we talk about terrorism today as it being exported to Europe, we deal with something in a way much more complex. Because terrorism coming from the Middle East, bringing in people of Islamic or Arab background from Europe back to the Middle East, has to do with the disintegration of the state system in the Middle East. For 100 years, we have accepted the state system in the Middle East being, uh, being comprised of what can be called Westphalian nation states, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, etc., Sudan. What we, uh, some of them were an outcome of British and French imperialism after World War uh, uh, I, such as Pico. Some of them were set up as colonial territories by the Italians in Libya, by the Brits in Sudan, previous to World War I. But the territorial contours of those countries were set up by Western imperialists. They were not an outcome of national movement as such in those countries. And this system more or less uh, held for 100 years, which is something one shouldn't really look, uh, uh, overlook. But when it was challenged, and it was partly challenged by the Arab Spring, or whatever we call it, the upheaval in the Arab world, it turned out that the identity of a lot of people in the Middle East was not to the state as such, but to their religious group, to their ethnicity, uh, to the region. And what we see today in countries like Iraq or Syria and Libya and Sudan and Yemen is the disintegration of the state. And it is a weakness and disintegration of the state 
that gives rise to a new phenomenon, which is not a state phenomenon. Some of them are sub-state groups like Hezbollah or Hamas, and some of them are super-state groups like uh, ISIS, uh, or if you wish, uh, Al-Qaeda. And we should take those developments very, very seriously. There seems to me a mistake in the West asking the question, which is the wrong question, how do we put Iraq or Syria or Libya or Sudan together again? I'm not sure Humpty Dumpty can be put together again. That we are dealing here with historical developments which have, which in a way, and you know it comes, it will be strange coming from a very secular Jew like Israeli Jew like myself to say that ISIS is very authentic. Authentic in the state, in the sense that in the Arab and Muslim world, for many, many decades, there was, even a century and a half, there was an attempt to adopt Western political models, the modern state system, modern kingdoms, uh, French republicanism, and then in the 30s, varieties of fascism, and then varieties of socialism and communism, and all of them collapsed. And ISIS, or in a way, if you wish, Al-Qaeda, is an attempt uh, a little bit imagined to go back to the original structure of Islamic Arab societies. And one can criticize this, and the outcome is murderous. But this is a reason which makes a lot of younger people who realize how the Western model of a Westphalian state doesn't really work, created dictatorships, created oppression. This is something that appeals to them because it is authentic. It is a constructed authenticity. We know how our identities are constructed. But it speaks to people in the most idealistic sense and in the most negative aspect of what idealism can make people. Idealism can make people murderous, and we, we see this. So one has to address those issues, not just issues of modernization or urbanization or economic development, but issues of identity. And perhaps in the end we're going to see a much more complex Middle East, not necessarily uh, a, a caliphate, but a different political structure, not again countries like Iraq, which were set up by the Brits, overlooking history, geography, demography. Iraq is not a country anymore. I mean, the, the Kurds have a de facto state. It's not a de jure state. Something similar may or may not be happening in, uh, in uh, Syria. Uh, to imagine that you can put Libya together again when you have, I think, now three governments and uh, two parliaments and I don't know how militias and one general, etc., or something in, in, in Sudan, we have seen already South Sudan and Darfur is still an open issue. The issue is not to put those countries together again, but to realize, and this has to be done on a local level, it cannot be done by the West, it cannot be done by the EU, it cannot be done by the United States, <coughs> by the United States, never mind the United States at the moment, but you know, the United States as it best, it has to be done locally and we have to listen to those voices very, very carefully, especially if we disagree with them. Thanks very much. So, as always happens when we have a discussion about terrorism with experts, we begin to unpack the word and it, it soon becomes clear that there are, are radically different contexts, radically different drivers, radically different meanings to, a, to the phenomena, which is, is to be expected. So with, with all that complexity in mind, I'd like us to move us on a little bit to how we counter the threat. Um, terrorism experts often say that acts of terrorism result from a convergence of motivation and operational capacity and that reducing the threat is about reducing both motivation and operational capacity. So this panel maybe is not, not the best panel to talk about operational capacity, but certainly in terms of motivation, I think we've, we, we've got a good shot at it. So can I ask each of you in turn to address, when it comes to reducing motivation, what do you think works and what doesn't work and why? And perhaps you can relate to that question at a couple of different levels. One is the immediate sense of this radicalized person in this particular network who needs to be drawn out of it with messaging and with new kinds of relationships. How does that work best? But then maybe if we could think also in a, in a bigger sense about the longer term cultural and societal changes we need in order to create societies that don't provide the kind of soil in which the, the radical recruiters can, can best work and so on. So, I wonder if we start off with you, Osama, about this question of how we counter the threat. Well, thank you, Alan. Uh, in terms of the immediate uh, threat, uh, how, how do you kind of de-radicalize people? Of course, that's an uh, ongoing problem. Now, now the, uh, uh, obviously, I, I spent 20 years as a committed Islamist, and uh, from Britain, our group supported 
uh, jihad, which we saw as defensive, legitimate jihads in Afghanistan and in Bosnia, uh, also in Chechnya and Kashmir. It, this was all pre-9-11. Um, I, I know about how the networks work, how the cells work, how, how these movements work. Um, you know, obviously, I've lived through that. And uh, I, I think there's one research group in Belgium which uh, actually came up with the, with the perfect model. I mean, it described it as it is. A lot of academics uh, um, and researchers, in my experience, actually are looking from the outside. They don't really get what's going on, uh, certainly from the point of view of uh, Muslim communities uh, within, within Western societies. But uh, basically, you, you have grievances, which can be poverty, racism, unemployment, Islamophobia. But you, you also have ideology. Ideology is very important. Um, Professor Shlomo has hinted at that. Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS and Islamist groups in general have a very powerful, simplistic and superficial, but powerful ideology which uh, unites people and motivates them to commit action. Now, people have their circles, of course, family, friends. Um, and uh, if they join one of these movements, they, they will basically shut out friends and family who are not sympathetic. Uh, people will often have sympathetic family and friends um, who they keep, who know about these activities, but if they're opposed to them, the people will often shut these out. And, and the key to de-radicalizing people is to keep in contact with them. Because once they cocoon themselves off, where they're only listening to their own uh, echo chamber, which is often inciting violence uh, and terrorism, uh, the next step is people uh, form a cell and then they go off and uh, do something or attempt to commit a, a terrorist act. And by that time, it's too late. There's, just, there's no way we can get in there. It's, it's when they are still uh, connected to the outside world, if you like, and are susceptible to other influences. And it's often through uh, family, friends, and other mentors. Um, and, and it can be with local Muslim communities uh, if they haven't shut themselves off from those either. Because don't forget, the, uh, the, the terrorists basically usually absolve themselves of their local mosque law to say they're sellouts or, uh, or traitors, etc. So, so, so that's you know, roughly the process that we're dealing with, and, it's, uh, and uh, we, we try, have to try you know, every uh, possible means there is, whether it's social media or whether it's, more importantly, people um, who have awareness of this and, and know when to step in. As I said, family and friends are, are the most uh, effective uh, people and mentors because there's that level of trust there which uh, authorities may not have. And second, in terms of the longer term that you asked about, I mean, I talked about it briefly earlier, Professor Shlomo expanded on that. Uh, it is a crisis of, of the modern nation state. I would disagree with you that ISIS are in some way uh, authentic. I would say it's largely an imagined authenticity because if you look at the, uh, the Ottoman state, the Ottoman state saw themselves as a Western state and they existed in Europe uh, for, for centuries and they kind of naturally uh, took in ideas, not as Western ideas, because they themselves are Western, they just regarded ideas from America and France, etc., as natural human evolution of ideas, and they experimented with democracy, for example, in the 19th century, they had an Ottoman parliament. The Ottoman state was the first modern state to decriminalize homosexuality in the mid-19th century, way before Western, other Western states, for example. So uh, what, it's true that ISIS and Al-Qaeda tried to reimagine a, a medieval worldview when you had Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Kufr, you know, the lands of Islam and the lands of non-Islam, uh, which were often lands of war, Dar al-Harb. And they're, they're going back, way back centuries. But uh, they skip out uh, all the development that happened uh, uh, with the Ottoman, with the Mughals in India, who were a, a Muslim minority government in a majority Hindu state, and how they very effectively, most of the time, uh, brought different religions together uh, in harmony, and, and all kinds of other uh, uh, experiments which are out there. Now, my particular work um, is to look at the four pillars of Islamism, which are Ummah, uh, Khilafah, or Caliphate, Sharia, and Jihad. Um, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with those. Uh, and the Islamists have a very, a very extreme notion of those, a very black and white us versus them, pre-modern, medieval understanding of those four concepts. And, and my work is pointing out that within the Islamic tradition, uh, and from centuries of Quranic commentary, etc., and development of human societies, uh, all four of those ha have been understood in a much more inclusive and universal way by great Muslim thinkers and theologians for centuries. And that's why uh, those theologians in the Muslim world supported the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. For example, they said these are entirely consistent with Islamic principles. They supported the Geneva Conventions. Um, the, the modern nation state, I think, because it was largely imposed by Western colonial powers, there is a crisis around that. Uh, and and not, it's very easy for the extremists to convince people uh, 
that these are constructed, that they are Western imposed from the outside. For example, I think a good example is Nigeria. Boko Haram argue that Nigeria is an artificial state constructed by the British, putting Muslim and Christian large communities together uh, after having converted Africans to Christianity um, and, and caused a bit of a mess. And they say, we don't recognize these borders between Nigeria and uh, Cameroon, and, uh, for example. And we, we need to remove them and go back to the land of the Caliphate of Sokoto, for example. Uh, so that is an imagined kind of uh, uh, um, romanticism, uh, of course, and it, and it leads to all this kind of violence. But the, uh, I think it's true. I was talking to Africans recently who agreed that actually the whole of Africa has, has this kind of crisis in terms of uh, the various carved up nation states. What is the reality that, uh, how should people organize themselves and rule themselves? Uh, I do agree with you that that, is, uh, that crisis is common across the Arab world as well, and the solution must come locally. And in fact, the European and Israeli security is, is bound up by the stability and security of the Arab and, and Muslim world as well. Uh, because I think we'd all like to see um, all of those areas living in peace in the future, or in more peace than, than they are now. Thanks, Osama. We might have a chance for you to come back to some of those disagreements, which are really interesting. But I'd like to turn to you now to address this question of what do you think works, what doesn't work, and why when it comes to the effort to counter radicalization, to de radicalize, and to remove the roots, so to speak, of the, of the problem? Well, um, I can't argue that there are no ISIS like attacks in Israel because there are. Uh, the Dizengov shooter and the Sorona attacks. The, the Dizengov shooter was a textbook um, ISIS jihadi attacker. He had a criminal record. He he had substance abuse. He um, had mental health problems. And not only did he go for maximum impact in his attack, but he also killed the the Muslim cab driver because sim simply because he could, because he was in the way. Um, whereas the, the stabbings and the car rammings that are fueled admittedly by, by the Shin Bet and the IDF um, by despair and hopelessness, and their, their solution, their, the effective solution that they've, they've gone on the record to say is that uh, the policy of preserving jobs for Palestinians has proved itself as an effective means of restraining attacks. And, and when even a right-wing politician like Bennett says, um, in the height of the, the wave of attacks, that we need to give another 100,000 work permits for Palestinians, it means he's aware that hopelessness and poverty need to be reduced. And the, while this is kind of a Band-Aid kind of um, solution that has been used and reused uh, with the uh, often rinse and repeat uh, status quo situation that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has, um, it's simply not enough. There, there need to be more steps towards resolving, because that's the only way that violence can actually end on both sides. Um, uh, you've mentioned the echo chamber. That's, that's a very important factor in, in adding to um, extremism, also, again, on both sides. Social media is a huge uh, factor in today's world, and um, as we can see from the American election results, people are, um, you know, the mia culpa of Facebook, because not only is the code built in a way to enable people to stay in their comfort zone and to have their own um, bubble, mm -hmm. where they read the media outlets that they want to read and that they like to hear and uh, nice for them. They, on, they also socialize with people who are like-minded. And this can be a very nice and safe environment, but when you um, are a right-wing Kahanist, mm -hmm. then 
this is dangerous. This fuels extremism on both sides. When you have politicians feeding those narratives, then it, it just adds to the violence instead of reducing it. Sure. And Band-Aid solutions of, of more work permits or easing restrictions on Palestinians, they are just that, Band-Aid solutions. Okay. Before I bring Shlomo uh, Avaneri back in, I'd like to uh, ask you, we just heard from Osama that he spends a lot of his time engaged in contesting the interpretation of the canonical Islamic texts and the key concepts and relating to people who've been drawn into extremist networks by saying to them, actually, the version of Islam you have is not the only one available, and here's a different one, even more authentic. Certainly, in the experience of the work that I did, going up and down for two years in, in and out of mosques and so on, I don't think a single person I spoke to who was an extremist, who became a non-extremist, who left those networks, every one of them had gone through that similar kind of experience with someone like Osama. They'd gone down, they'd sat, and they'd looked at the definitions and so on, and, and, and got to a different place. And, and, become more interested in different kinds of Islamic ideas, Sakina, middle community, and so on and so forth. In your experience, which I think might be a little different, is there a role for moderate religious leadership? Um, is it effective in terms of engaging with extremists and, and drawing them away, in your view? And if, if not, why not? Um, I think there has to be a role, but we haven't been able to find the, um, the right approach to take mm -hmm. because um, xenophobia is easier to fuel than hope. It's easier to push somebody who's um, contempl who's not sure, who's maybe going through a crisis or going through a, an identity crisis or an ideological crisis or um, whatever crisis that leads people to end in, in extremism because um, while I can't speak from experience but I assume it comes from a place of questioning and looking for something that is answered quite easily with extremism because uh, religious fanatism gives people something they're looking for. Um, perhaps uh, moderation can help, but I haven't seen it succeeding in, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I, I, well, Baruch Marzel and Kahanism are an example of that. It's not gone. It's still very much around. It's very much, it's very strong. And in the same sense that Islamic extremism is still very much there. And um, the loud voices are not the moderate ones. They're not the attractive ones. They're not the ones that people follow. Whether there needs to be a role, there has to be a role. I just don't think we've found the right place for it yet, the effective place for it yet. Thank you. Um, I want to leave some time for questions, so I think we'll, we'll skip our part three and maybe open to the audience. But I want to, first of all, I feel like I'm going to ask you an impossible question now, which is that maybe the other two speakers have dealt with the question of countering the threat at that micro level, which is really important, of engagement with individuals, messaging, ideas, networks, and so on. If you return to your analysis of the collapse of the Arab state system, the rise of jihadism, and so on, I feel like I just want to say, what's the answer to that? But as you look forward and you, you, you imagine yourself advising statesmen, what, what is it that the West should be doing to try to begin to at least contain and then move in a different direction some of those underlying trends in the Arab world that you talked about? And maybe if you want to speculate, how do you think a Trump presidency is going to impact on our ability to do, to do any of that? OK, you give me 45 minutes. That's fine. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, le let me say, uh, first of all, I, I listened today and there was a little bit of good news. I listened to the 
a home secretary and I'm very much uh, encouraged by the sort of things that she was saying, especially when it came to cross-border cooperation. It seems to me that one of the problems in Western Europe in the last few years, which facilitated the kind of terrorism in Paris and in Brussels was that security services, for obvious reasons which I understand, are very careful not to share information because uh, it's secret, it's problematic, and it gives you power. So when you share it, uh, you lose a little bit of your power. And I think we see now at the beginning of much better cooperation, the sort of things that happened between the French and the Belgians that made possible both uh, attacks in pra Brussels and Paris probably are not going to be repeated in the same way. But let me try to answer uh, um, the other question. First of all, on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, because I think that it's a, a different kind of motivation, so we have to address it. I don't think that just Israeli occupation of two million Palestinians in the West Bank is the cause of all the terrorism we get from the Palestinian side. But there's no doubt that if there's going to be some movement or some signs of movement or some messages that Israel is serious about a two-state solution, that Israel is serious not to make things more complicated, for example, by building more houses, this message is not going to do away with Palestinian terrorism because some Palestinian terrorism is not just about occupation, but it's just about the existence of Israel. I'm not naive about it. But certainly messages that will try to reach out to the other side and give people more hope, it can help. I'm not saying in an absolute way, but in a relative way. When it comes to Europe, I think the situation is more complicated because the European issue has to do with the collapse of the state system in the Middle East. And one should say it very, very carefully. Even if Daesh is going to be completely uh, defeated in Syria, uh, the answer is not, uh, uh, is not Bashar al-Assad. He's not a great uh, leader of a more moderate or more accommodating or more tolerant uh, Syria. So uh, the choice is very difficult. I don't see any easy answer to that. But the answer is not European policy. The answer is, are there enough forces in the Arab Muslim world to give an alternative both to Daesh and to uh, dictators, bloody dictators like uh, Assad. Uh, but the issue, and I think this is really bothering the European countries is how do you address the volunteers coming from the West and going there? And here it seems to me that the West has to do some very serious homework and soul searching. I'm, being to be, I'm going to be a little bit uh, abstract and uh, uh, simplistic. There are basically two models in the West and both of them have failed. There is an inclusive French model. All of, our, all of us are Frenchmen. And therefore, the French state is a secular laicite. But I think that if you are a Muslim religious woman in France and you cannot wear your head uh, scarf because this is considered to be against French laicite and republicanism, I, s I understand why you feel discriminated and you feel persecuted. Does it justify terrorism? No. But when uh, French policemen go on the Riviera and try to uh, make sure that the women will wear bikinis but not the other thing uh, around, uh, this seems to me that French republicanism is a little crazy. And one has to accommodate uh, in a pluralistic way uh, the community traditions. On the other hand, we have seen in Great Britain, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, that the multicultural approach, which is pluralistic and tolerant, creates self ghettoization in this country. And self ghettoization creates also the alienation from the majority culture. Is there a way to accommodate both aspects? I'm not sure, but this is where one should look uh, for. Uh, this means that uh, not only in the Middle East, where the state system is up to a point co collapsing, some of the things which have been made uh, universal in the West have to be rethought precisely because they create problems. I mean, there are no absolute problems to pluralism or multiculturalism, but just as the French have to rethink things, the uh, Brits have to rethink things. I'm not going to dare to say anything about uh, the United States and President-elect Trump, because I don't think that he knows where he's going, so who am I to tell you where he's going? <laughs> Very wise. Okay, we have um, some time for some questions, and um, we'll maybe take uh, a couple together, and um, we'll have at least one round. So if you just indicate by 
holding your hand up, say who you are. Um, okay, so we have a question right in the front row here. Hi, um, you said xenophobia is easier to fuel than hope. Do you believe that Western responses that are aggressive and promote aggressive responses to terrorism are more likely to promote a counter response from terrorist organizations rather than actually benefiting the greater community? I guess that was that for Suhan, in particular? Um, for all of you. Okay. So, well, I am I'm going to reiterate what you said, that there are two sides to every coin. So while um, oppressing gets the, the um, the minority's violent response, sometimes over liberalism, gets the majority's frustration. We've seen that in the UK and we've seen that now in the US too. So the, again, what uh, Professor Avneri said, we need to find the, the middle ground in not alienating the, the privileged and not oppressing the minority, the ethnic minorities. Okay. <laughs> Very quickly, I mean, we had a decade of the war on terror, a uh, kind of military-led uh, campaign. And I think now, looking back, uh, most leaders and, uh, and analysts agree that there is no military solution to defeating terrorism. Of course, it helps to defeat and um, take out various terrorist cells, terrorist leaders, um, but uh, unless the underlying issues are resolved, uh, as we've seen, uh, you, you get a new generation of, of terrorists basically still devoted to a similar cause or, or ideology. Um, and so that's why I think like the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, you know, somehow has to be uh, revived. I mean, all sides have to work harder on that and, and other friends outside uh, can help also. And I entirely agree uh, in terms of this values issue, in terms of what the pluralist societies look like. Uh, they're the French model, the, Amer the, the American model, the, the British model. And they have their strengths and weaknesses and, and we all have to rethink that, uh, rethink that very carefully. Uh, but uh, you know, we, we have to have people feeling engaged uh, as, as stakeholders in, in the way the conversation is going. Uh, otherwise, sadly, they will resort to violence if they feel that uh, you know, that's the only way. Let me add one word which is marginal to what we have said today, but not to the issue itself. Uh, it has to do with the idea of secularization. Uh, because uh, during the Arab Spring, uh, people in the West were looking for the secular forces, for the democratic forces, and this is natural. Secularization in the West, be it the British model or the French model or the American model, each of them are different, but they are, all those societies went through process of secularization, was an outcome of the Enlightenment. And therefore secularization went together with liberalism, with tolerance, uh, with tolerance eventually with democracy. In the Middle East, not only in the Arab Middle East, but in the Muslim Middle East generally, secularization was a different process. In all of those countries, of course, there were uh, thinkers, but politically, secularization in the Arab and the Muslim Middle East was an authoritarian, autocratic imposition from above. Uh, the Shah in, in Iran, Ataturk in, uh, in Turkey, uh, the uh, Abdul Nasser, the Baathists, those were attempts uh, to follow a European model in a way, but imposed from above. And therefore what we see today, and again, the issue is not to justify anything that is happening in the name of extreme and murderous religious interpretations, but what we have seen in different forms, in Iran, in Turkey, uh, and in the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, is a return of the repressed. I mean, uh, pre-modern societies, most of them not uh, secularized, secularized forcefully by dictators are pushing back. And uh, some of this pushback is very, very murderous. So one has to understand the terms which grew out of the political and intellectual and religious history of the West, like secularization, can play in different ways in different societies if those societies are in a different social structure. Uh, you can very well understand, when I say understand, I don't mean agree, what uh, um, Erdogan is trying to do in, in Turkey because uh, the Ataturk secularization was an elite minority imposition uh, done by using semi-fascist uh, uh, models in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, 
then it became a little bit more open-handed. So uh, when one looks at those societies, and I think this is something which has been overlooked in the West, is one has to study the history and the social history and the social traditions of those societies, including the various strengths in Islam. Again, I mean, I'm not an expert on Islamic uh, theology, but I mean, there are various schools in Islam. The Hanbali school is different from other schools. And one has to understand those things and not to stereotype Islam as Islam, just as one shouldn't stereotype Christianity or Catholicism or Protestantism. Protestantism means also the Enlightenment, but Protestantism also meant the Puritan Revolution in this uh, country, which eventually became a, a, a liberalizing force in the 17th century. I wouldn't like to be a dissenter or Catholic uh, in Puritan Britain, so and this was under Protestantism. So one should be very careful when one deals with historical history. Thank you. The Puritans are also the levelers, uh, who founded British democracy as well. So. <laughs> Good. So um, we've got one more question, I think, or one or two of participants. So I think there's somebody back there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for very interesting presentations. This is a very simple question, but a very sincere one, which is what, what can I do to contribute to my community? And I ask this on my brother's behalf, who lives in Israel. Terrorism is the big bad beast, and it's something we all feel very remote from and have a tendency to think that it's someone else's problem until maybe it comes knocking on the door. And I appreciate that the solutions will, I mean, since the, the push factors are so complex, will often come from within, within communities. But, but you know, what can I do to contribute to the society around me or my brother around him to actually try and, and present a more human face? I mean, uh, Pro Professor Avenari spoke just before about um, not generalizing. That, that, that's something that I think particularly with the current media, we, all, we fall into that trap, possibly all of us, um, because of the fear factor that, that runs our lives. But yeah, what can I do? Okay, so the question is, what can individuals do in a practical way, whether they're in Europe or in Israel, to really contribute to, to, to countering the threat? This will have to be our last set of answers and we're also going to have to be reasonably brief because we've got we've got to move on to the next session so um I can add my two cents okay we'll start here um i've been living in jerusalem for the last three years um the situation is very tense and fear is you can sense it on both sides i don't speak arabic in public I don't pick up the phone when I'm on the bus or on the train when my mom calls. And I understand that Israelis are also afraid. But um, we can't be slaves to fear. And I usually say this as a joke when I get to work that I know that every time I get on a crowded bus, I'm going to find an empty seat next to the hijab wearing woman or the. the <coughs> Arab looking Muslim man with the beard which is kind of nice for me because I don't have to stand but what you can do as as a person as one person is just be a person take that seat um, talk to them be civil smile a little bit of kindness goes a long way Um, thank you. Okay, I mean, I don't think I have an easy answer to this, obviously. Uh, but uh, in a schoolmasterish way, I would say, first of all, do not generalize. When one talks, one should not talk about the Arabs, the Muslims, the Jews, the religious Muslims. Uh, one shouldn't uh, look at a woman with a hijab as a potential terrorist or a an Orthodox Jew with side locks as a, as a supporter of Kahana. Uh, the important thing is to try to address real issues without trying to generalize. And this addresses especially political leaders. We as citizens are obviously responsible for our private uh, acts. It is very important for political leaders, be it in Europe, be it in Arab countries, be it in Israel, when they are under pressure, when there is a threat, to try to define the threat, to fight it, but to define it and not to generalize it. And I'm not sure that all political leaders always live up to this precept. 
Uh, thank you for your question. I, I think we live in very kind of dangerous and polarized, divided times. And, and uh, my answer to you in terms of what can you do is um, where there is tension and division to actually reach out across that divide. Uh, yes, do not generalize. I would go further than both my colleagues, actually. Um, I think Sahar was a bit diplomatic. And actually, to, to reach out and literally make friendships uh, across that divide. Now, one of the reasons I'm here is I went to uh, uh, private secondary schools in this country. Uh, my parents sent me, rightly or wrongly, to private schools. And for the first time, I, had, I met Jewish people. I'd heard all kinds of anti-Semitic kind of um, stereotypes about Jews um, growing up in London in a devout Muslim uh, culture. And it was only at school, boys' schools, uh, where after seven years of secondary school, uh, six or seven years, I had lots of Jewish friends. Uh, and I discovered the kind of common humanity as well as differences. You know, the first intifada happened at that time. We used to argue about that a lot, but uh, many of us uh, re remained friends uh, for a long time, and that stays with you as an imam, as a Muslim activist, even whilst a jihad in Afghanistan. I remembered my Jewish friends, you know, uh, back in London. Now, I've been to Israel a couple of times, um, and, you know, Israeli Arabs are said to be 20% of the society. Well, I noticed a lot of the kind of menial workers were, were clearly Arabs. We had a session with Israeli Arabs who complained that they, they felt Israeli society was stratified and they were right at the bottom. Some of them complained about being spat at in public and you know, being called dirty Arab uh, and that kind of uh, horrific language, which goes on in the Arab world as well, actually, in the Arab countries, you have stratified societies. I think it's a common Middle Eastern disease. Um, I, I think people have to go beyond, especially Israelis have to uh, perhaps visit the occupied territory and do work out there, you know, in, in the territories they're allowed to visit. Uh, where it's not illegal under Israeli law. People really have to actually make friendships and, uh, uh, and work with all of the uh, kind of charitable and humanitarian organizations that build genuine friendship. I mean, I'm an imam here in London. One of the things I do a lot is blessing interfaith marriages. And a number of, a number of those involve Muslims and Jews. Uh, I was once asked to conduct a marriage between a British Pakistani Muslim man uh, and an Israeli Jewish uh, woman, for example. And I was delighted that they were getting married. Now, I mean, that's a small example, but you know, there was an Arab uh, Jewish wedding in Israel last year, I think, where there were extremist Jews protesting outside, for example. Um, uh, you know, little things like that. Friendships, we don't have to get married to the outside, but uh, uh, friendships certainly help, I think. Uh, it, it's one of the ways that civic society is strengthened and gives hope to everybody on all sides. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so it's just left to me to ask you to express your gratitude and use your way to three fantastic uh, presenters. Thank you.